Yo, what's up everyone? My name is Nate and welcome to Peace Chapel. Thank you all for being here. There's a lot happening at Peace Chapel, so I wanted to take a few minutes and share a couple of things coming up for you and your family. So check this out. I love God. You love God. What's wrong with you? First, I would like to remind you guys about our new prayer line. In a time like this, prayer is our biggest weapon. Prayer binds believers together, encouraging each person present by sharing burdens with God, praising Him together, and seeking Him for direction. We learn and are sharpened in our faith when we pray with other believers. Group prayer is one, is one of the ways in which we can carry each other's burdens. Since we are all affected by this virus in one way or another, it's important for us to carry each other's burdens. Our prayer line is not only open every single day, but it's open four times a day. We have an 8 a.m., a 12 p.m., 4 p.m., and an 8 p.m. We also have a 6 p.m. youth prayer line as well. The number for the prayer line is 425-436-6370, and the access code is 269-259. Second, as you can see, we are rolling out our online community, and we need your help. We are looking for volunteers or interns who, are, who would like to assist us with media production and content. We need social media managers, content creators, photographers, video editors, and the list goes on. With the world becoming more tech and content driven, this could be a way for you to fine tune your skills, learn a new skill that could possibly be essential in the future, and most importantly, you get to serve the kingdom of God. If you're interested or know anyone who might be interested, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of the leaders here at Peace Chapel. And finally, as you know, Easter is around the corner and one of the biggest days of the year for us. We have some exciting things planned for you guys, so make sure you stay tuned so you don't miss out. I love you guys more than you can ever imagine and enjoy the service. I love God. You love God. What's wrong with you? All right. I'm trading my sorrow hey. And I'm trading my shame And I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord Yeah, 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 yeah Oh, I'm trading my sin I'm trading my pain I'm laying it, laying it, laying it down for the joy of the Lord Let's go, Johnny Trading my song, trading my shame, I'm trading my shame. Laying it down, I'm taking it down for the joy of the Lord. Hey. I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my secret. Trading my pain, I'm trading my pain. Laying it down, I'm taking it down for the joy of the Lord. Let's 
joy of the Lord. Yeah. Trading my sickness, I'm trading my sickness. My pain, I'm trading my pain. Laying it down, I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. Jesus, you're the name, you're 
Worship team led by the talented and gifted Sean Brazell, founder of Worship Junkie. You can find him on worshipjunkieradio.com. 
What's up, Peace Chapel? It is very difficult for me to do this, to speak in front of a camera in an empty room, but you know what? I'm willing to do, and we're willing to do whatever it takes to get the message out. And so I just want you guys to know I definitely miss you guys. Before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to some people who are watching live online. Uh, this is not to say that I miss anybody any more than the other, but I just feel led to give a shout out to a few people who are watching us live online. Uh, sister Lucy Winston, God bless you, sister. We are praying for you and your household. Um, Brother Otis Bailey, God bless you. Uncle O, we're praying for you and your household. It was so beautiful to see you watching live last week, the picture that Gabby sent. That was just a beautiful sight. And uh, I just want to uh, give a shout out to Eve, our worship uh, keyboard player. She's not able to worship with us. I want to point out something that she said uh, to us in, a, in our group message. She talked about um, not being willing to be here or not being able to be here because she didn't want to pass on something to our run the risk of picking up something that she would pass on to some older people that she lived with. And so I have much respect for that. I think we have to make sure that we are being responsible when we're out and being responsible, not just for ourselves, but also for the people that we'll come in contact with. And so kudos to Eve for being responsible. We miss you and we can't wait to see you again whenever uh, the Lord provides an opportunity for you to be here with us. All right, and so let's jump into today's message. Um, I want to welcome those who are worshiping with us online for the first time. I want you guys to know that today's message is going to be extremely difficult. I've been praying about this all week long. I, uh, the Lord has just been giving me this, and you guys know for me, I, uh, I like to speak motivational messages. I like to motivate people. And, you know, this message might not be motivational. I think this message is more of a warning, but I think it's a message that we need to hear. And so I want to be faithful to make sure that I proclaim the full counsel of God. Whenever God gives me something, I want to give it to the people. And what's interesting is that God has remove the people from the building. And so we have no one to wax eloquent for. We have no one to put on a show for. It's just us and this camera. And so we don't know who's listening on the other end. We don't know if people are paying attention on the other end. But I just want to make sure that I remain faithful to what God gave me. And so I want you guys to know that uh, to make today's message is extremely difficult. And so... Um, God means business. God is serious. He, he means business. He's, he's not playing. And, I, you know, this is not to scare anyone, uh, but this is to, to warn you that, that God means business. And I, I, I'm not bold enough to say that God is behind what's going on with COVID-19, but I can say this, that he hasn't stopped it. He can stop it. He's allowed it. And so that means that he has a purpose for it. Um, you know, for us as believers, oftentimes we, we're guilty of painting a picture of God that presents him as being nice all the time. But God is not always nice. If you look throughout the Bible, there are times when God is aggressive. There are times when God gets fed up. And to be honest with you guys, um, God has a lot to be fed up about. And so I want you guys to take notes. This is important that we, we take notes. And I want you guys to just kind of give us your attention today. I know it's so easy when you're watching online to get distracted, to mess with the kids and, you know, get on a, a social media. But I want you guys to just give your full attention because I believe that I have a word from the Lord today. And I want you guys to engage. I want you guys to be involved in, in the conversation online. Type amen, type praise the Lord. We want to treat this as if we're at church, even though we're not in the building, in the church. You guys know the church goes with us wherever we go. And so again, um, I just, you know, this is not an easy message for me to preach, but I want to remain faithful to my responsibility to God 
and I want to give you guys this message. We don't have to defend God when it comes to things like this. God absolutely operates in this way. We see examples of it. God is not always nice. Every now and then God gets fed up. And so we see examples even in the book of Genesis where God destroyed the world with a flood. And he only left Noah and his family. We see that he destroyed an entire city, Sodom and Gomorrah. Even in the New Testament, we see things like the wrath of God. Paul talks about the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness that God has made himself known to people, but they suppress the truth by their wickedness. And we see that because of that, God gives people over. And so God does give people over. There was a post on Facebook, and you know, I've, the last couple of days I've been staying away from social media and all types of media because there's just so much drama and so much filth that's just being spread it all throughout the internet air, airwaves. But there was a post that caught my attention, and it sort of motivated today's message. It was one of my Facebook friends, and I want to share with you guys what he said on this post because I believe he shared something that all of us kind of at some point we've thought like this or we still think like this. I, I believe that we have people who are watching that are on the fence. I mean, some people who are watching, you're solid believers and you believe that God is in control, but then there are some people who are watching and you're questioning God about what's going on. And so I want to share with you guys what he said, and I'm going to share it verbatim and I'm going to try to explain some of the words, but here's what he said. He said, good morning, Facebook. I know most won't read this because it's too long, but I got to interject some common sense. He says common sense. I have to interject some common sense into this coronavirus versus religion God debacle. He goes on to say people of faith have been praying all around the world in different languages to different gods under different religions and different ethnic groups. But this virus continues to infect and kill people at an alarming rate. So at this point, I'm a, or he means I'm going to assume God isn't real or as powerful as people or the Bible makes him out to be. Or that the virus is more powerful than God like Satan. And so like many of you know who are watching online, you guys know that this is not a new argument. This is something that we've heard before. It's, maybe it's been stated differently, but basically what he's saying is that if God is all-powerful, then why won't he do something about this disease or the spread of this disease? And so I want to talk to you guys today with this thought in mind. When the hedge comes down, when the hedge comes down, as I stated earlier at the beginning of the message, God means business. And I'm just going to let you guys know, I promise God that I'm open for him to use me however he chooses to use me. So I might get completely away from my outline because I want to make sure that I give you what God wants you to have. And so if you have your Bibles, if you have your pilots, if you have your tablets, or if you use your phone, I want you to turn with me to the book of Job, Job chapter 1. And we're going to look at a few chapters, or a few verses in chapter 1 of Job. And um, as you guys know, a lot of people kind of question whether or not Job was a real character. I believe that Job was a real character because you have... Uh, passages like Ezekiel, he refers to Job as a historical figure. And then if you fast forward to the New Testament, James talks about Job as a real person who really lived. And so I believe that Job was a real person. So let's look at Job chapter 1, starting at verse 1. 
And we get a description of this man, Job, and a little bit of his background. It reads, I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. And this is important that we catch this because it's giving a description of Job and it's describing Job as being blameless and upright. The text goes on to say that Job feared God and shunned evil. And this becomes increasingly important as the story unfolds because this wasn't a bad man. This was a good man. He's described as being a blameless man. He's described as being a man who feared God and he tried to stay away from evil. If you fast forward and skip down to verse 6, we pick up a conversation, and this is so interesting. As I read this, I, I'm challenged a little bit to really wrap my mind around this because it gives a picture of God that's just hard for me to grab or grasp. He says in verse 6, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And so the Bible teaches that two-thirds of the angels fell from heaven, that Satan, when he fell from heaven, he took two-thirds of the angels with him. But we can see here, these are things that are going on behind the scenes. We can see here that the angels are accountable to God. It says that they came to present themselves to God, and Satan was there also. And so I, if you, you still have time, if you, if, if you haven't done so, you can share this, this post. You can copy this link and share it with your friends. You can text it out to your friends because I think they need to hear this. They need to hear some behind-the-scenes stuff that's taking place with God and things that are happening in the spiritual realm as it relates to the physical realm, that there are things that are happening in the spiritual realm that impacts the physical realm. This is really, really good. And so here's the conversation. Verse 7, the Lord said to Satan, now notice the Lord said, he said to Satan, where have you come from? Give an account to, to me for what you've been doing. I, I want to know what you've been doing. And when God asks questions, he don't ask questions for information. He already knows the answer. He says, where? He says, where have you come from? Satan answered. God said, Satan answered. I want you guys to see the difference. You know, a lot of times we try to put Satan on the same level as God. Satan is very powerful, but he's not more powerful than God. Satan is accountable to God. He answered. He answered the Lord. From roaming, this is what I've been doing. I've been roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth in it. I've been roaming throughout the earth. I've been going back and forth in the earth. <laughs> what have you been doing, Satan? If, you, if you've been roaming the earth, see, people don't, they don't recognize that there are things that are happening in the spiritual realm that you cannot see, but it's real. He says, I've been roaming the earth. I believe that God has had it. I just want to go back to that. I told you guys, I'm not going to stick to the script today. I just want to give it to you guys as God has gave it to me. I believe that God is fed up. We've taken God for granted. We've placed things above him. We, and, and God says, I, I, I will not share my glory with no one, but we've, we've worshipped things above him. This whole thing about the universe. People are bragging on the universe. They've created this, I believe it's like a religion, the universe, as if the universe is on the same level as God. Let me tell you something that you might not know. The universe is evil. The universe is wicked. The universe is a very dangerous place to live. If you live longer, long enough on the universe, chances are you, you might end up getting shot. You might end up in a car accident. You might end up with a disease. 
The universe is evil. The universe is cursed. And, and not only is the universe evil, but the people who reside on the universe. Some people might not want to hear this. I told you guys, I, I like to preach those motivational messages to encourage people to save money, to encourage people to get their minds right. And you should save money and you should get your minds right. But I also want to talk to you guys for the truth and, and warn you guys and, and make you aware of some things that you might have lost sight of, that the universe is evil and the people who live on the universe is evil. But not only is the universe evil, and not only are the people who live on the universe evil, but there is a supernatural evil that exists that we cannot see. And we see this exchange that's taking place between God and these supernatural demons that have a certain level of power here on the universe that we try to put on the same level as God. And so Satan says, I've been roaming the universe and I've been looking for somebody that I can ruin. Then the Lord said to Satan in verse 8, have you considered my servant Job? This is somewhat disturbing to me because it seems like the Lord draws attention to Job. It seems like the Lord singles Job out. And we saw in the beginning that Job was a blameless man. He was a man that was upright and he feared the Lord. Why would God do Job like that? I have a hard time with this. I'm just, I'm just being honest with you guys. When I first read this, this was very difficult for me to wrap my mind around. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Look at how God describes Job. He says, there's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. He says he's blameless. In other words, when it comes to Job's peers, Job treated people right. He was a fair man. He loved the Lord and he feared the Lord. He walked with a certain level of reverence. And God is singling this man out. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Satan replied. Again, Satan is accountable. There's this conversation that's taking place between God and Satan. Satan replied. He says, does Job fear God for nothing? Does Job fear God for nothing? And this is, this is a different type of fear. What, what Satan is saying is, I mean, is, is there anything that he needs to worry about? You, you got him covered. I can't, I can't get to him. In fact, he goes on to say, have you not put a hedge around him and his household? Have, have, have you not put a hedge a hedge around Job and his household. In other words, I can't get to him. <laughs> that means that Satan had already tried. He says, I, I can't get to him. You placed a hedge around him and his household and everything that he has. If, if Job was around today, then, then Satan would say, you placed a hedge around him, his kids, his wife, his car, his house. I can't get to him. I want to I wanna get him kicked out of his house. I want to get his car repossessed. I want him to get in a car accident. I'm trying to get to him, but I, I can't. I can't get to him because you placed a hedge around him. And you blessed the work of his hands. Even Satan knows that God is the one who protects. Even Satan knows that God is the one who blesses. He says, you bless the works of his hands so that his flocks and his herd spread throughout the land. You bless this man beyond measure and I cannot get to him because there is a hedge We've taken God for granted. We've taken the heads for granted. We've become so comfortable in this universe. We call it the universe, right? The universe. We've become so comfortable in this universe that we've neglected to recognize 
that this is a very dangerous place to live. And that's why people have these questions. That's why people begin to question God. Where is God when all of these things are happening? God is still on the throne. God doesn't respond to evil. God controls evil. And I know that's hard for us to wrap our minds around that. You know, we as Christians, we want to paint a picture of a God who is nice because we feel like people will be more attracted to him if we paint a picture of him being nice. But every now and then we see examples of it in the Bible where God says enough is enough. I'm not surprised. If God is behind this, what I'm surprised is what has taken him so long. We've been disrespectful to God. We've elevated the NBA above God. We've elevated money above God. We've become people who bless the blessing and worship the blessing over the blessor. So God, if he's not behind the coronavirus, he shuts some things down. He has brought this nation and the world to its knees. Told you this is not easy for me to preach. I'd rather preach a positive message, but God wants me to let you guys know that he has had it. He means business. There was a hedge around Job. Satan was trying to get to Job, but he could not get to him. And then Satan goes on, he says, have you not placed a hedge around him? Satan goes on to say, he says, but now, stretch out your hand. See, Satan knows that God is in control. He says, stretch out your hand and strike everything that he has, and surely, surely he will curse you to your face. What Satan is doing is he's accusing, that's what he does, he's the accuser of the brethren. Whether you believe he exists or not, it doesn't matter, he really exists. What he's doing is he's accusing Job of serving God for what God can do for him. He doesn't really love you. He's only serving you because you bless him. Who wouldn't serve you if they were in his shoes? But now stretch out your hand. And strike everything that he has, and surely he will curse you to your face. In other words, let me get at him. I want to touch him. And Satan wants to touch you. I want you to know that Satan wants to touch you. But there is a hedge that God has placed around you, and we have to learn how to appreciate the hedge. We've taken the hedge for granted every now and then. Every now and then, beloved, God will bring down the hedge. I don't understand that God does things that we don't understand. He does things his way. But every now and then, God will bring down the hedge and allow Satan to touch us. And it'll reveal whether or not people are real about their faith. He says he'll curse you to your face. But then this next verse is sobering. It's hard for me to understand. The Lord said to Satan, very well. Everything he has. It's in your power, and that's what people don't understand, that Satan has a level of power and authority. It's, a, it's delegated power. It's delegated authority. And Satan, look, this is the visual that I get of Satan. He's like a very vicious pit bull that's on a leash, and he's growling, and he's trying to get at his prey. He's trying to get at his. He wants to bite you. <laughs> And when God allows him off the leash, he will come and he will bite you. He says, very well, everything that he has is in your power. He is the God of this world. He is much more powerful than regular human beings. Satan has a power to use natural disasters. Earthquakes, you can see that, that takes place in the story of Job. Whirlwinds and all of these things that Satan has the power to do. Don't take him lightly. He's the God of this world. But he's under accountability. He's under the authority of God. And that's hard for us to wrap our minds around that why would God use evil like that? God does that. He uses evil to chastise his people. He uses evil to prove the faith of his people. Now notice the limitations. He says you can have at him. He says, but the man himself... Do not lay a finger. You can touch his possessions, but you cannot touch him. 
That's proof that God is in control. God is the one that protects us. You look at what's going on today. We've grown accustomed to putting our confidence in the government. We've grown accustomed to putting our confidence in money. But God has broke everybody down and everybody is on the same level. We're in a building preaching to an empty room. And so the mega church is on the same level as a small storefront church. God has broke everybody down to the same level. Satan, you can have at him, but you cannot touch his body. There has never been a time where a relationship with God is more important. A relationship with God today is more important now than ever before. He says, you can touch him, but you cannot touch his body. And then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. He couldn't wait. He was drooling at the mouth and he went right at Job. And you just see a series of trials that take place in Job's life. And eventually, eventually, Job loses his family. He loses everything that he has. But Job was firm with his faith. He says, even though he slay me, I will still trust him. That I have faith in God that goes beyond any circumstances, any trials. I will trust God no matter what. When the hedge comes down. And so let's look just a little bit more at one portion of the post from my Facebook friend. He says, this virus continues to infect and kill people at an alarming rate. He says, so at this point, I'm going to assume that God isn't real. And I can understand if a person doesn't know all of the facts, they hear this God that's being preached by a lot of churches and pastors and Christians That he's always nice and he always, you know, if you just have enough faith, you can get him to do whatever you want him to do. Where are the word faith teachers now? Where where are they now? Where are the naming and claiming people at right now? I mean, surely they should be visible right now. They should be present right now. Where are the word faith teachers right now? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This is very important. The presence of suffering is not an argument against the existence of God. I want to say that again. The presence of suffering is not an argument against the existence of God. That God does exists even when suffering is taking place. And and I would argue, and I would argue, and a lot of people don't want to hear this, I would argue that there are times when God is the one who is behind the suffering. Because we've been foul. We've taken God for granted. We've left God out of the church. And this is not just an Old Testament thing. You can see this in the New Testament. Some people say, well, that was the Old Testament God. This is a New Testament. We have a New Testament God. We're in a different dispensation. The God God that we serve, the God of the Bible, is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Yes, he is a God of love. He is a God of peace, but he's also just. And he should be respected. Matthew 6, verse 33 Jesus said this. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. He says this. Look, he says, you will have suffering in this world. But be courageous. Suffering, he says, it will be even for believers. You will have suffering in this world. He says, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. The thing that makes God so attractive is that he has conquered evil, that evil is subject to him. And so we've taken God for granted. We've taken his love for granted. We've taken his patience for granted. And we've taken his provisions for granted. God is on the throne. He never loses any power and I really want to really challenge the church. I really want to challenge the church 
Because I believe, you know, we look at passages like 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, where he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive them to the entire world. world. When we we see passages like that, we communicate that to the entire world, that the world needs to repent. And the world does need to repent, but that right there is for God's people. That was for Israel. So if there's anyone that could be compared to Israel today, it's the church, that the church needs to repent. That God has taken all of his people out of the buildings and we need to repent. We have placed things ahead of God. If you don't believe that God gets fed up from time to time, I want to share a couple of passages with you, and I'm almost done. In Malachi chapter 1 verse 6, very powerful passage. God says this. This is God speaking. He says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my respect? Says who? Says the Lord of hosts. To you, O priests, who despise my name. He's talking to people who are supposed to be serving him. He says, where is my honor? Where is my respect? Verse 10, he says, oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors. In other words, close the doors. I don't want people going into the buildings anymore. He says, oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors. It's not not that big of a deal for God for people to gather in the buildings. God is too big to be contained to a building. He says, so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I don't want useless worship. There's no heart behind your worship. We gather together. We become so common with God that we don't even put our heart into our worship. He says it's useless. He says, I don't accept. God, listen to me. God does not accept every form of worship. He doesn't have to. He goes on to say, he says, I am not pleased. I want you to type that in the comment section. God is not pleased. He says, I am not pleased with you, and I will not accept any offerings from your hands. Verse 11, he says, my name will be great among the nations. Everybody is dependent upon God. All of the local officials, all of the nation's officials, all of the people all around the world, they're scrambling trying to figure out how they can stop COVID-19. Guess what? We're all dependent upon God. He can stop it. He has it. So he has a purpose for it. He says, my name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord God Almighty. If you're taking notes, if you're engaged with us, I need you to type this in the comment section. This is real. I need you to type this in the comment section. God means business. God means business. God is not a joke. God is tired of the disrespect. Malachi chapter 2 verse 1, he says, and now he's talking to the priests. He says, and now you priests, this is a warning for you. See, for those of you who try to make God out to be just this nice guy that is always nice with people, every now and then God gets serious with people. Nobody wants to be taken for granted. I can relate to where God is coming from. He says in verse 2, he says, if you do not listen, we're praying and we're asking God to do things and we want God to heal the land, but God is saying, listen. He says, if you do not listen and if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord God Almighty, look at this. This is the God that we preach about. This is the God that we sing to on Sundays. He says, I will send a curse. We want to get God off the hook. We feel the need to protect God in situations like this. He says, I will send a curse 
on you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not resolved to honor me. God will be honored among the nations. Chapter 3, verse 13. You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. Just very disrespectful. People are just so disrespectful with God's name. I mean, just the energy is just bad when it comes to talking about God. There is no reverence at all, and God has had it. He says, but you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? Verse 14, you have said, what's the use of serving God? Why do we need to serve God? Look, he says, we have gained, what have we gained by obeying his commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? There's no, there's no benefit to it. I mean, people are driving down the street past the church, and they seem to be more blessed than the people that are in the church. What is the purpose for serving and, and worshiping God? He doesn't bless you anyway, which is exactly what Satan was accusing Job of. Serving God for what God can give him. And there are a lot of believers, or so-called believers, who are serving God for his blessings, and they don't love him. He goes on to say in verse 15, from now on, this is, this is my resolve, this is my position, this is how I'm going to respond to this. From now on, we will call the arrogant blessed. For those who do evil get rich. This is the mindset of people, right? And God is calling them on this way of thinking. And those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. People are getting away with serving, with not serving God and being disrespectful to God. So why should we? And so as we bring this, this message to a close, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This is extremely important. Those who trust God they run to him when the hedge comes down because the hedge has come down. And the people of God, if you're really, really serious about your faith, you need to run to him. And that's what's going on. I mean, our prayer calls are lit up. People, more prayers are going up to God than ever before. Proverbs 18 verse 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. When the hedge comes down, the people of God run to him. Not only that, when the hedge comes down, God is still present. And I want to encourage you for the rest of our time together. When the hedge comes down, God is present. He's there in the midst of the storm. The psalmist said this in Psalm 46, verse 1. He says, God is our refuge and our strength. An ever-present help in a time of trouble. He says, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give away and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, we will not fear. Because fear resolves absolutely nothing. When those who trust in God are in trouble, they run to God. When the hedge comes down, the people of God, they run to him. And when the hedge comes down, the presence of God is still there. And then lastly, when the hedge comes down, you need to notice that God has a purpose for the pain. That God doesn't just allow us to go through pain just to go through pain. That there is a purpose for the pain. Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 6. He says, in all this you greatly rejoice. In what? Though for now, for a little while, you may have to have had suffered grief, but in all kinds of trials. Let me read that again. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Verse 7, he says, these have come so that, the purpose, these have come so that prove your, the proven genuineness of your faith. It's come for the purpose of proving the genuineness of your faith or greater, that are great, of greater worth than gold 
which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, God have a pur- he has a purpose for your pain, and his purpose for your pain is to prove you. His purpose for your pain is to purge you. I love what James said, the half-brother of Jesus. He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter, when you fall into various trials. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith, that your faith must be tested. The testing of your faith produces, it's doing something, there's a purpose for it. The testing of your faith, it's painful, but there's a purpose for it. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. He says, but don't stop it. James goes on to say in verse 4, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, so that you may be complete, so that you may lack nothing, that God uses trials to complete or to fulfill or to fill in those things that are deficient in our character, but we have to allow God to do his work in the trial, and we have to remind ourselves that every now and then God will let the hedge down, but when the hedge comes down, there is a purpose for the pain. And I don't want to be insensitive when it comes to things like this, because there are people who are, who are, you know, their loved ones are on their deathbeds, right? That's painful, there are people who, who've lost their jobs, right? And they don't know how they're going to make ends meet. And so I don't want to be cavalier about what you're going through. But what I can tell you is that God always has a purpose for your pain. And so as we conclude, I want to give you guys just a few things to, to keep in mind. Like, you know, we, what, what made Job, the story of Job so powerful is that Job survived when the hedge came down. And there's a reason why Job survived when the hedge came down. Because Job did things when the hedge was up. And that's really at the heart of the issue. What are you doing? What were you doing when the hedge was up? What were you doing when, when God was protecting you, when Satan was trying to get to you? What, what were you doing? I want to give you some things that you need to do because not everybody is experiencing this pain at, every, at the same level or at the same rate. But when the hedge comes up, because this will pass, it will pass. This is not the first pandemic. In fact, I just found out that there was a flu, a strand of the flu in 1918 that killed over 100 million people. But we still have people here on, the, on, on earth today because this will pass. And so when the hedge is up, here's what you need to do as I, as I close out today's message. You need to learn to discern God's voice. That God is speaking. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. You need to learn to discern, discern his voice. Not only do you need to learn to discern his voice, but you need to learn to appreciate his presence, his protection, and his provisions. That we're not, we're not saved because of the government. We're not saved because of our military power. We're saved because of the hedge. And we need to give God glory for the hedge. We need to praise God for the hedge. He's the one that protects us. He's the one that provides for us. Appreciate his presence. And then we need to practice giving God our best and not our leftovers. That's at the issue. At the issue, the heart of the matter is our worship. In light of everything that God has done for us, the only thing that he wants in return from us is our worship. And so when it comes to giving God, we don't give God our leftovers. We give God our best. And then I want to encourage you, when the hedge is up, you need to love your family. You, don't, you never know when it's the last time you will see your family. We need to learn how to love our family. We can become so busy with work and doing things, and we can even disguise it as ministry that we neglect our home. Your first ministry as believers, your first ministry is your home. You need to love your family. And then lastly, take care of your body. It's crazy when all this stuff broke out, people were running to the store and they were in the toilet paper aisle. They were running to the store to get toilet paper. You should have been running to the store to get vegetables and fruit 
so that you can take care of your bodies. This is the temple of God, and God wants us to take care of our bodies. And so when the hedge is up, beloved, we shouldn't be laying down sleep as if the hedge won't come down. Our God is in control. He's on the throne. Nothing happens apart from him allowing it to happen. God does use evil to get his point across. And my message to all of those who are watching online, here's my message to you. You need to repent. Repent of all known sin. Repent means to turn around. Stop playing with God. Stop taking his commands lightly. You need to repent. I want to pray for you because I know this is easier said than done. So I want everybody that's watching online, I want you to bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we confess that we've taken you for granted. We've taken your love for granted. We've taken your protection for granted. We placed our confidence in things and stuff. And so when things like this happen, we just, we, then we start questioning, where are you? You've been there all along, but we've been placing other things ahead of you. And so, Lord, we're repenting of that. We're turning towards you, Lord, and we're placing you first. No more playing games, Lord. No more playing games. We're going to be serious about our worship. We're going to prioritize our relationship with you. And so I pray for everyone who is listening at the sound of my voice, Lord, that you will put a hedge of protection around them and that you will cover them and their families. Help them to fall in love with you like never before. Lord, forgive us. We've sinned. We fall short of your glory. If you're listening and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. I want you to repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. I've sinned, Lord. I've done things that I should not have done. I've willfully rebelled against you and your commands. Please forgive me of my sins. I'm turning to you to embrace Jesus Christ as my Savior. I recognize that I cannot save myself. And so I'm trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and take over. I am yours. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Peace Chapel, all of those who are watching online, let's celebrate those who just made that decision. And if you did make that decision, listen, here's what we want you to do. We want you to text Peace Chapel, all one word, Peace Chapel, to 31996. That's Peace Chapel, all one word, to 31996. We want to come alongside of you and support you. We want to point you in the right direction so that you can link up with a church family so that they can come alongside of you and support you. God bless you, Peace Chapel. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling to present us faultless before his throne. To the only wise God, our Savior, be power, majesty, and dominion, both now and forever. And all of God's people said, amen. Type amen in the comment sections. God bless you and God keep you. Now, I also want to thank those who have been supporting us online. I found out that our online giving has increased tremendously. We are so grateful to God for you, for supporting us online. We as a church, we still have responsibilities. We still have to pay our utility bills and things like that. But more importantly, we want to continue to do ministry. I think now is the most important time for the church to step up to the plate and share the love of God, which is found in Jesus Christ. And so we're, we're encouraging those of you who have not started giving online, we're encouraging you to start giving online. We're going to put the online giving number on the screen for you guys. You can text GIVE to 562-379-5157. I believe that's the number, 562-379-5157. And all of it is safe and secure, and your money is going towards furthering God's kingdom and what he's doing here at Peace Chapel. And so just know when you give to this ministry, 
you are giving through this ministry because we are God's hands, we are God's feet, and we're doing everything that we can to share God's love with everyone that we come in contact with. God bless you and God keep you. I look forward to seeing you guys next Sunday for Easter Sunday. One other thing about Easter Sunday, instead of having communion today, we decided that we're going to have communion next Sunday for Easter Sunday. And so get all of your stuff together. You need crackers and you need some juice, crackers and some grape juice. And we're going to observe the Lord's table together. Uh, So if you need some, if you're an older person that can't get out, please reach out to one of our leaders and we'll make sure that we get that over to you guys. God bless you and God keep you in his ever loving care.